So why don't we just do this if we can um, as we open up in prayer. If you have a prayer, let's just lift it to the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Why don't we go old school? Can we stand together tonight and let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And again, whatever needs that you have or something that you may be praying for somebody else at that time, let's get in agreement and let's lift this up to the Lord. Father, we bless you tonight. We give you glory and praise. We thank you, God, for all the great things that we see going on around the Rock Worship Center, Lord, but also in the lives of the family of the Rock Worship Center. Thank you, Lord, for the healing touch in many lives, God. We thank you for just breakthroughs and new jobs, Lord, and the great things that you're doing, again, all around us. This is our year, Lord to experience the things that you have promised and because you were able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So we thank you, God, for already seeing these things manifest in our church and in our church family's lives, and we just give you the glory for it. Lord, the, the needs of the folks that are in this room tonight, God, as we lift up to you, anybody joining us online, Lord, and just our church family as a whole, you know the things that we're praying about, God, and we lift those up to you tonight. Expecting to see miracles and breakthroughs just each and every day, Lord. It should just be normal normal things that we see every day. That it's just the power of God working in and through the church. So we thank you, God, for all the great things you're doing. We thank you, Lord, as we're coming to a close on this long study that we've been doing on the Holy Spirit. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and now into the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. And pray, Lord, that we each are... We are demonstrating that fruit in our lives, God. Each and every day that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our lives to everyone who encounters us. And as we finish this study up again tonight, Lord, we just pray for understanding. We pray for application, Lord, that we don't just check this off the list that we finish the Bible study, Lord. But this is something that we have grown through and continue to grow in. So, Lord, again tonight, we just pray for your Spirit to be here to just lead us and guide us. To, to teach us, Lord, to bring to remembrance the things that we need to know, Lord. And we just give you glory, Lord, and thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So a reminder, again, the notes on here, we're going to be starting off on page four on this. Um, number five, fruit of the Spirit, kindness or gentleness. And King James it says gentleness. Um, when you're using Strong's Concordance, you always go to the King James. I'm usually reading from the New King James, so I'll have the that version beside of it. Um, how many people have experienced kindness in your life recently? Amen. Amen. Is there something that just stands out, an act of kindness or a person that you met or the word gentleness that just comes to mind from something that you've encountered recently? If, if so, you should look at that as you've encountered a fruit of the Spirit working through a person. That means the Holy Spirit is working through somebody, showing these attributes of God. Amen? And hopefully we're all seeing that. Again, you know, for me, um, I'm still working on some of these myself. Amen? The gentleness side is not always my, my stronghold. I, I'll, I'll say this, and me and Brenda were having a conversation the other day, and I chuckled about this today. And so it's just so funny. Uh, we were talking about a little bit about ministry styles, and Brenda said, well, well, your ministry style is kind of hitting the devil in the face. That's kind of your ministry style. I said, okay, I, 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 I can take that. I can take that. And it's like some people are more gentle and, you know, they're just so sweet and calm. And they talk to you like this and they're just so gentle. And that's, that's not something that I always just hear referring to me as my gentleness. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa's out here going, mm -mm, no, not at all. <laughs> But, uh, but if you need somebody to hit the devil in the face for you, just give me a call. Hallelujah. Amen. But let's just go with this. And again, you've got the notes for this. Anybody online, just join in. You can go on YouTube. This will be posted. Uh, part one should already be up. Part two should, will be there. There is a link to the notes on YouTube that you can go along. Again, on the end of your notes, there is a there is an acknowledgement where I, I borrowed a lot from the teaching of this from a, from a prepared lesson, and it was very good, and I've been enjoying it myself. Amen. So the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness or kindness, the Greek word protes is exercising God's strength under His control. Amen. Ain't nobody greater than my God. Nobody stronger than my God. Hallelujah. There's no power in the world greater than my God. Amen. We start looking at his strength, but it's under control. 
Uh, gentleness is often confused with meekness because the words are translated from the same Greek term above. Gentleness is proactive. Meekness is reactive. Okay? Gentleness is proactive. What's proactive mean? Going forward. Or proactive means you had thought about it ahead of time. You were prepared. Reactive is what it is. Something happens and you react. Amen. And we start. So, so meekness is a reaction. You know, we talk about meekness. We've talked about it a lot. That meekness is not weakness. And if we go back up to this, weak, meekness is power under control. So meekness should be able to be able to harness that power. But again, meekness is a reaction. Um, we start talking about Gentleness is a mark of a sweet spirit or benevolent kindness. And I ask that question, have you experienced somebody lately? Have you had that experience with kindness or gentleness? Have you ever, have you ever experienced somebody and you just said they had a sweet spirit about them? I, I, I think about many people that I know and I've met in, in my church life, my Christian life, and, and I can attest to that, people that have just a sweet spirit about them. Um, it's a characteristic that makes a person easy to get along with. Amen. Anybody else still working on that? Hallelujah. But it's, it's this thing. This, this is the Holy Spirit working through us. Even though that we are maybe not in the natural, that person is always easy to get along with, but the Holy Spirit working through us will be producing that fruit in us to make us easy to get along with. Um, Careful to not become unfeeling of the rights of others is an active trait of how we should treat others. Do y'all think we should be always be kind and gentle to people? Even if they don't deserve it? You start looking at the grace that we received and we're supposed to be uh, producers of that. Um, and again, uh, looking at other people's feelings. And their rights. Um, we a lot of times we fall into this. We just want to have it our way, but it's it's an active trait of how we should treat others. So we say it's an active trait of how we should treat others. So does that mean active, purposeful? That we know we're supposed to do it, and we have to work towards doing that. It's a, it's a, something that we have to do every day. Um, treating others gently. Or there's still one more here. Let me go about this one. A disposition that is even tempered. Tranquil, balanced in spirit, unpretentious, and that has passions under control. Y'all know that person? Everybody's looking around. This this is one of the this is one of those tell your neighbor moments over there. Hallelujah. Now we start thinking about that. I mean, it's very good. It's like the person even tempered, tranquil, tranquil, balanced in spirit. Has the passions under control. Amen. I mean, but this is this is good stuff because this is just showing us how we should react. How we the, the fruit that should be produced through us. Treating others gently, actively seeking to make others feel at ease. Show respect for to show respect for the personal dignity of others. Just show respect. You know, sometimes it's like it's not always about agreeing with people, but we can respect people, right? I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. We were talking about um, some, I, I had a couple of Mormons came to my house one day. They were actually looking for somebody who used to rent from me. And I was talking to them, and the guy told me, he got relieved. He said, well, I appreciate you being so nice to us. I said, no problem. He said, because, you know, I know you said that you're a pastor of a church and this and that. And he said, he said why, do, why, why do the Christians in this area hate us so bad? I said, well, I don't think I'm. We don't agree with you, but we don't hate you. He said, no, most people act like they hate us. I'm getting into Sunday's preaching, so I have to be careful with that a little bit. But um, just to show respect for people and show dignity to people. You know, I've, I've shared this with y'all before, and I'm trying not to preach this. None of this is in any notes, but a young girl I used to work with was um, homosexual, gay, LGBTQ+, plus whatever. And um, I loved her. I still do. I, I still talk to her. And it's like, I, I would always talk to her and just have fun with her. And uh, I'd mess with her also. Because, you know, one day I said, was that your friend that was here? And she'd blush real big and all 
this stuff, but she didn't know how to react to me. But she came up to me one day and she said, I have a question for you. I said, okay. She said, you're a pastor. I said, yes, I'm a pastor. She said, okay. But you're nice to me. Good. She said, but you're like nicer to me than most people are. I said, well, well good. I said, I've heard the way you talk to some people, though, so you know. <laughs> but we, we just started talking. She said, but I don't understand. With you being a pastor and you know that I said that, I, said, I know that you have your friend. And then she blushed again. She said, yes, but you're, you still treat me nice. I said, I, I do. I said, I said, I love you. <coughs> and she said, I believe that. I believe that you love me, but... She said, so if I ask you about how you feel, I said, if you're going to ask me if I agree with your lifestyle, you're probably going to know what my answer would be. She said, fair enough. Fair enough. And we were able to have that conversation, and I was able to treat her with respect and dignity, be able to show the love of Christ to her, but I never agreed with her lifestyle. And she knew that I did not agree with her lifestyle, but it didn't change the fact that I was able to love and respect her. Amen. So this is when we start talking about kindness and gentleness. Um, being able to avoid blunt speech in an, an abrupt, I can't say that word, abrupt manner. Anybody deal with blunt speech? Do not be threatened by opposition. Any, you know, people get threatened by opposition. You're supposed to gently instruct asking God to dissolve it. Do not belittle, degrade, or gossip about your brethren. Now, this is going to be talking about our church family. This is the thing, you know, we should not belittle, degrade, or gossip about each other. We shouldn't be doing that about anybody, right? But especially the household of faith. So we start looking. Uh, gentleness is, cons is uh, considering others. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, then ge gentle, or considerate, and easy to be, entre easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So we start thinking about all these attributes. That's, I mean, that's a, whole, that's a whole Bible study sermon in one thing, talking about gentleness. And these are some good notes for you to go back and maybe take a look at your life and do a checklist and see how many of these that you can check off or say, I'm still working on that one. Amen. So that's one of the, and the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all go back to the beginning as we start talking about it. This is, this is singular. It's not plural. This is not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit of the spirit this is we're supposed to we're supposed to have all of these attributes in our life with the holy spirit working through us can we do it alone no we need the holy ghost doing this amen so we're going now from gentleness we're going to goodness fruit of the spirit goodness the bible says that it is the goodness of god that will lead sinners to repentance and salvation god is good and all the time, God is good. Amen. We have heard that all together so many times. I heard it preaching in the prison camps, and I've heard it. People, but even today when we say that, it gets people's attention. They're like, I want to know about this good God. Good God Almighty. We, we start thinking about this, and that, and that draws people. This is the goodness of God that will lead sinners to repentance and salvation. The world needs to know that there's something they can turn to. This good, amen. This particular quality is very powerful fruit to have operating in your personality because it has, a, it has the drawing power that it has. So in other words, a person that is good by nature, a person that is operating in goodness, people are going to be drawn to you. Don't you feel like you're drawn to people that are going to treat you good and be nice to you and act right to you and you just feel that they're good to you? Amen. You ever had somebody you just said, that, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good man. That's a good woman. That's a good friend. They're so good to me. And it just makes you want to be with that person. Um, it has no manipulative qualities to it. So you should not have to manipulate people. But you shouldn't have to manipulate people to get them to come to church. I ain't giving away no more TVs and iPads and that kind of stuff to get people to, enter, to invite people to church. We did that for a while. I was like, huh, we're going to do a contest. Whoever gets the most invitations to come back, y'all should just invite people because you love them and you want them to experience Christ in their life. Amen. Right, so we start thinking, but we shouldn't have to manipulate people. You know, even though now it does work, we, we, Miss Joanne, we're going to have to start having some more 
dinners after church because the last time we had a dinner after church, we had the biggest attendance we've had in a long time. So sometimes that, I don't think that's really manipulating people, though, is to say, listen, you need to come to church with us this Sunday because we're eating afterwards. We do every Sunday. Every Sunday? All right. Every Sunday. How many people volunteer? How, how many people um, have a particular volunteer named to clean up? <laughs> that's, that's a lot of clean up every Sunday. So we'll have pop tarts and a bowl of cereal. But yeah, I mean, we started looking at this. Goodness is a quality. Again, it's not manipulative. Have you ever been manipulated? Have you ever had a person that you felt that the person, instead of being good to you, they were manipulative? They may have had something that they did for you or gave to you, but there was, a, there was always a string attached. That's not, that's not goodness. The Greek word, I'm not going to try to say, but there it is for you. Pastor Mark, you want to give that one a shot? Kalanisi? <laughs> Kindness, goodness, benevolence. Again, goodness is a moral character. What's a, what's a moral character? What's a moral? moral? What does that mean? Uh, to me, I'm, I'm thinking is like, this shows that you're a Christian. This shows that you're a person of faith. So this is a characteristic of your life that demonstrates Christ. The goodness is a moral character and deeds which are beneficial to others. A person that exemplifies this fruit is honest in his or her motives as well as conduct. Then you have kindness versus goodness. The difference between these. Kindness is the desire for happiness for others. Goodness is planned activity to advance that happiness. Okay? So you can be kind and you can just desire for people to be happy. We can be kind on Sunday mornings. We can pray for the church, pray for the community around us. That's kindness. We're believing for, we're believing for them to be happy. But goodness, the fruit of the Spirit, means we're going to plan activities to advance that happiness. It is generosity in action. Amen. So that's, that's a good thing to think about. You're making plans to do good things for people. That's goodness. Goodness is universal, goodness is universal meaning everyone has, a cap, has the capability and opportunity to do good. Everybody can do good. The world does good. There are, there are non-Christian people out there that do tons of good things. Um, there are people that I don't always know their faith and different things, but you start looking at this like, you know, Michael Jordan turned 60 and just gave 10 million, was it $10 million to make a wish foundation to celebrate his 60th birthday. He wrote a check for $10 million to make a wish foundation. Amen. Wow. That's awesome, isn't it? But there are other people out there, non-Christian people that do good things all the time. So it can be good. Anybody can do this. But goodness is not expected to be an occasional thing, but a way of life, a way of living. This is, a, this is a fruit of the Spirit. This goodness, this attribute of God should be evident in our life always. How many people still working on that? All of us, I'm sure. Amen. But then we have faith. Faith also, or faithfulness. Um, faith was also a gift of the Spirit. We, we talked about that supernatural faith in extreme conditions that rises to the occasion. But... Um, this fruit of the Spirit, the original translation is fidelity of faithfulness. This fruit shows itself in trustworthy stewardship for God and in reliability that qualifies to teach others. It is part of the character of one who can be trusted. So we start talking about faithful person. That's the characteristics of somebody that can be trusted. Faithful means loyal, Full of faith or test, firmly and resolutely sticking with something or someone without wavering. Amen. Have you ever had that one faithful friend? Yeah. You know, you've, you've, you've always had a group of people that you had that one faithful friend that you know would always be there when you needed them. We start talking about this. That should be a fruit of the Spirit in a Christian life. You know, as a Christian, if we tell somebody we're going to do something, we should do it. Amen. Amen. If, if, somebody, if we tell somebody you can count on me, they need to be able to count. If you say you call me anytime, you better not hang up when you see their number. Amen. If you have that person say, oh, you can call me anytime, and every time you call them, it goes straight to voicemail. You know, is that a faithful person? That person says, if you ever need, I mean, y'all hear me on this, okay? If you need anything, 
If you need anything, just let me know. Okay. You call them up. I need a babysitter Friday night. I can't do that. If you need anything else. Okay. Um, you know, I need you to pick me up and take me to work Tuesday morning because I don't have a ride. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to help you with that. Okay, well, um, listen, I, 2 o'clock in the morning, you give them a phone call. Yeah, call me Call me after 10. Just to, you know, start thinking. Don't tell somebody. How many people have had somebody tell you that in your lifetime? If you need anything, anything at all, call me. How many times do you feel that that's sincerity? Or how many times is it just out of obligation? You and, and we, even Christians, we fall, we fall guilty of that. Oh, yeah, if you need anything at all. There are people that come to the church, I don't even know their names. I, because if it's not wrote down and I don't see them often, if I can't remember their names, but shaking their hand, if you need anything, here's my number, call me. You might have to remind me who you were. Amen. But I'm going to answer my phone. But again, we just need to make sure that we are, if we're saying we're going to do something, we're going to do that. If you're going to be that faithful person, be faithful. If you, if you say you're going to do something, do it without wavering. God's faithfulness towards us, and you can go back and read these scriptures, is unfailing. Has God ever let you down? Now, sometimes people have let you down and you've fallen under the illusion of thinking that was God, but that was people that let you down. God will never let you down. He is unfailing in His faithfulness. Um, he is infinite. His, his faithfulness is infinite. It will always be there. Whether here or by the time we get to heaven, he's always going to be faithful. And his faithfulness is beyond compare. Beyond The best person that you've ever known in your life compared to God is very small. God's faithfulness. You know, I was, I was young, now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken and his children begging bread. Amen. That's the faithfulness of God. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. That's the faithfulness of God. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Amen. This is his word, and it's faithful, and he always is. God is faithful and loyal to his promises. Amen. God is bound by his own name. To fulfill his promises. His, his promises are yes and amen. He's faithful and loyal to the covenant and his people. The covenant agreement that we've entered into with him. He is faithful. I had to preach there for a minute. Y'all remember a covenant is a two-party agreement, right? So that means that you're, you have to be faithful in living up to your part of the agreement. Amen? I, I, can't, I can't just leave covenant alone with that. Say God is faithful. God is faithful. He is but the covenant agreement is broken if you are not faithful to your part of it. And then he's no longer bound to be faithful to the covenant because you broke the covenant. Amen. Uh, God is faithful for forgiving sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to wait to one time of year or get to church at the altar on Sunday morning to be forgiven of sin because he is faithful. He is faithful in providing counsel. Matter of fact, he has given us the Holy Spirit here with us and we know that we have Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, sitting in intercession for us. Amen. God expects us to be faithful. And you can go back and read this in Matthew. But ask yourself this question. I like this question. If everybody was as faithful as I am, what kind of church would this be for God? So you, you just have to ask yourself that question. Where is your level of faithfulness? If everyone in this church were as faithful as I am, what kind of church would this be for God? So you just have to really think about that. That, that can kind of work both ways. But I start thinking, I mean, this one. if everybody was as faithful in attendance as I am, we'd have to, we'd have, to have three services on Sunday morning. Amen? Or ask yourself, if everybody was as faithful in their giving as I am, if everybody was as faithful in their reaching out to their brothers and sisters in Christ, and just, you know, where what's your strength? And you start thinking, if everybody did what I did, or as faithful as I was, what would this church be like for God? Of course, it could be that, well, wouldn't be nothing happening. So again, that's just, that's, I love the question. I've, I've, I've prayed about that one myself. Fruit of the Spirit, gentleness or meekness. So here we got into gentleness and meekness again. So meekness um, or gentleness. The Greek meaning for this means tamed, bridled. The same word translated for a well-behaved horse. How many people have ridden horses in your life? 
You ever got on, you ever got on one that wasn't very tame, wasn't broke very well? We grew, growing up, we had this old horse that we used to like riding. She'd let you ride her, but as soon as she got tired of you riding her, she'd go run under the barn. And the barn was old and the hayloft was low, and she knew exactly what she was doing. She'd go run under that barn. With the, her, her plan was to knock you off. <laughs> But like I said, she was a good old horse. You could just go up to her and rub her and everything. You want to ride her bareback, but it didn't matter. Just jump on that horse and take off, and she's good. Until she was done, then she heads to the barn, and she's going to knock you off. So we start thinking, is that the kind of horse you want to ride? Or do you want to ride that horse as soon as they feel the weight? I mean, I've, I've been on a horse time, too. As soon as they feel your weight in the stirrup, you start to pull up. They start kicking and getting antsy. You know, you want a nice job. Me now, if I'm going to ride a horse, I want one that you almost have to get on it to move. But we start thinking, how are we with it? Meaning, tamed or bridled. Some of us are like, I am going to be tamed. I'm not going to be bridled. Sometimes our tongue needs to be bridled. Our attitude needs to be bridled. Meekness is an attitude or a quality of heart whereby a person willingly... Mm, here's, some, here's, some, there's a, here's a hard word coming up here. Whereby a person willingly accepts and submits without resistance to the will and desire of God. Mm. See, we live in a day and time where the, the word submit, nobody wants to hear that word anymore. I ain't submitting to nobody or nothing. You better submit to God. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Amen. I want to do it willingly. I mean, have you ever really just thought about that? Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. And you start thinking how easy that is to do it willingly. But if you take a person that's resisting that, I think back about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they would not bow to the, to the image. And they're like, you better bow. You better bow. You're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace and all this stuff. But we start thinking about this. Um, submission to God is, is something we have to do. Uh, it says, develop through having a humble opinion of oneself and the inner strength to control one's emotions, tongue, and behavior. Um, I'm going to interject one under in thumbs. We're fingers. Typing on a keyboard. Um, it's a freedom from rebellion and pride. Again, this, this is something we, we could spend a lot of time talking about. This, this is that thing. It's an attitude or quality of heart whereby a person willingly, willingly, we have to choose to do this, Mary. It's not something that God's going to force upon you. This is something we have to choose to do. Amen? I've preached a lot of times that I want God to take free will, but he won't do it. But stuff like this, he's not going to make you do this. It's like you have to be willingly, to, you have to submit to him. Submit without resistance. And I just, you know, start thinking about this word humility. We start thinking about how many people think about all the problems in the world so often. We have a lot of problems in the world. But, you know, what does the Bible say? If, if my people who are called by my name will just pray, right? If my people who are called by my name will pray, is there something before that? Will humble themselves and pray. See, there's this whole thing about humility. And this is another thing that's not popular in, in, the, in the church today to talk about humility and to start talking about pride on here. It's freedom from rebellion and pride. And that comes through humbling ourselves before an almighty God. Amen. But when we humble ourselves and we pray and we act in meekness, then we start seeing things happen in our life. Biblical examples of this, um, Moses and Jesus Meekness in the life of a Christian according to the world. And I'm not, just go back and read these scriptures later. I'm trying to keep these classes fairly short here. But um, meekness in the life of a Christian will, will, be blessed, will have a blessed and content life. Contentment. We just talked about that, right? Started talking about being content but not complacent. Um, we'll receive praise and honor. We'll praise and honor the Lord. You take a meek person that's going to praise God. It's going to honor God. That's, that's a sign of meekness. Um, a meek person will receive guidance. You ever, you ever tried to guide people lately, give people advice, and then try to offer them some some counsel? They don't want to, they want to hear they want agreement. And you know, this is this is a thing we talk about a lot. People, do you ever have people asking you your opinion? 
or asking you, what do you think about this? Or, hey, will you pray with me on this? And then you find out they really don't want your advice. They want your agreement. They come to you, i got a real bad problem. Can you give me some advice? And as soon as you don't give them the advice that they want to hear, they go ask somebody else. Well, you'll, you'll only find someone that will agree with you. You will, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's called Facebook. <laughs> Donna, keep you posted. Donna just shared. Donna just, Donna, Donna, I like Donna's Facebook. She just, she shares my stuff every day. Amen. <laughs> So that's good. That's the start. But she shares positive stuff. Amen. And I'm starting to think, but it's like meekness. Let's get by this. A meek person will have peace. Amen. Um, shall be exalted. That's by the Lord. Will be, preser will be preserved. Walks in joy. We talk, uh, you know, joy. That's a big one too, you know. But we can, a meek person is going to have that joy in their life. The meek shall inherit the earth. A meek person makes no reputation for themselves, but it's all about Jesus. A uh, meek person possesses self-control and wisdom. And they, they go back and read all these scriptures with all this, but this is meekness. And again, meekness, power under control. doesn't mean we're weak. doesn't mean that we let the world take advantage of us and abuse us. No, it's not that. Remember, we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us, the greatest power this world's ever seen. But we're able to control it and, and get, a, get a good dose of act right. Amen. And then we get here near the end of this. Uh, self-control. Temperance. Self-control. Um, this, this works right up there with long-suffering. With that whole patience thing. Amen. We don't have patience. We don't have self-control. And if you start thinking about that, if you don't have patience, you don't have self-control, what kind of mess can your life turn into? Amen. <clears throat> I mean, this, this is temperance, kratos, one holding himself in, governing of one's desires in thoughts, emotions, and speech. See, the other one, I was going to go back and talk about emotions. It started talking about um, when we're just in meekness. I want to back up just a minute. It says, um, inner strength to control one's emotions, tongue, and behavior. Okay, so meekness gives us that ability. To emotions. How many times have you acted on emotions and you regretted it later? All of us can probably write a book about that where we've said something out of an emotion or reacted out of an emotion and later wish we hadn't. So again, we have this ability to control that. So with temperance or self-control, governing one's desires and thoughts, emotions, and speech. Self-control. Y'all know the toothpaste illustration, right? Once the, once the toothpaste is squeezed out of the tube, you can't put it back in, right? All you can do is clean up the mess that it left behind. So temperance, self-control, holding those thoughts. Apple finally did something that they've needed to do for a long time. In the last update, you can retract a text message now. You can unsend a message. How many times in your life have you wished that you could unsend a message? I, I wish I could have unsent that message the other night. 30 seconds after I sent it, Brenda said, um, you spelled that word wrong. <laughs> I'm telling people to invite and they're going to invent. Did you invent somebody to come to church tomorrow? Bobby was quick. He was the, he was the first one. Now, I hadn't figured out how to do that one yet. So, but you know, I, I would have loved to have been able to retract that, but I couldn't at that time. But you know, here's the thing. Text messages. Emails. I've, I've typed a lot of responses on Facebook in my life only to delete it and not send it. And thankful to the Holy Spirit for being there for those. Amen. Does anybody bear witness to that? Have you, have, you ever, have you ever found out the limit of words that you can type in a message before it cuts you off then all of a sudden I can't send it? That's this self-control. That's governing your desires and thoughts, emotions, and speech. Think it before you say it. Just being able to hold your emotions together. The ability to avoid excess and stay within reasonable bounds. Amen. 
Uh, we won't even talk about credit card debt, will we? Start thinking about this whole thing about, you know, well, we really can't afford that cruise. Yeah, but it would be nice. Let's just go ahead and put it on, let's, let's use three credit cards. We'll split it between three credit cards. Or, um, you know, that new pair of shoes. I really need that new pair of shoes. Or we, well, we can't really afford to go out and eat tonight, but I don't feel like cooking. You know, there's so many things. Like that. It doesn't have to just be about that, but it's uh, the ability to avoid excess and stay, and stay in reasonable bounds. I think there's life lessons for everybody in that, isn't there? Self-control. Sometimes, sometimes we just lose the ability to say no to things that we should. Being a Christian, it can be, you know, a lot of our life is saying yes to the right, saying yes to the right things and saying no to the right things, saying no to the wrong things. Is that that's what temperance is, being able to say yes and no appropriately. Um, the Greek word means having command or mastery over. Do you know that the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to have mastery over yourself, your spending habits, your eating habits? Amen. I'm just going to tell y'all, candy cannot be in my house. Can't have candy in my house. If candy's in my house, I'm going to eat it. Caramel M&M's, especially. If you've never had a caramel M&M, just forget I told you that. Pastor Mark's over here. I don't think I ever had any of those. Pastor Mark, you've got that crazy high metabolism. You can probably eat all you want. But um, there are certain things that's like, you know, I just know I've got to stay away from them. You give me a bag of you know, like M&M's. You're supposed to eat when you, that's one bag. You eat the bag of M&M's, right? Not when you buy a one-pound bag. But see, we have to have that self-control to eat in portion control. How many people go get ready? Oh, this, look, there aren't many calories to this. I can eat this. And then you realize you just ate four servings. <laughs> Don't that make you mad? You get something that looks like a single serving thing. You go, oh, there was only 150 calories in there. So wrong, that was 600 calories. That was four servings. <laughs> so we start thinking about these things. Or like I said, spending habits or different things, staying in reasonable bounds, having control over that. The Holy Spirit gives us that control. We talk a lot about, you know, addiction. We're in, we're in a community that has a, a, a huge addiction problem. We talk to different people with different addictive, addictive problems. And so many times we say Jesus is the answer. The Holy Spirit in your life is the answer. That God can give you control over your life in these things. Maintaining possession over one's own behavior. So there's another self-control. I talked Sunday morning a little bit. I brought out the word hissy fit. I got a few chuckles on that because I'm, you know, having hissy fits, having having tantrums, just having, you didn't get your way and you're just going to have a fit. There's self-control. You can control your own behavior, moderation or control. Temperance is modification and gratification of desires. Gratification. Okay, think about that. Let's hold it. Let's take that. Temperance is modification and gratification of desires or appetites. It's an inner strength under the direction of sound judgment. In Christ, we have the strength to control ourselves. So gratification of desires. You have something that you want. The flesh says, get it. Amen? So we start looking. Now we need to be able to modify that. But again, it's like if there's some, if there's some M and M's in the house, if there's some M and M's in the house, my flesh is going to know it, and I'll sit there. My, my, I'll be not thinking about anything at all. But it'll be nine thirty night. All of a sudden, I got to have some M and M's. I, I, I need those M and M's, and it's like, but evil, now the Holy Spirit says, you know, you don't have to have those M and M's. So I just keep the M and M's out of the house. But again, our body, we want the gratification. I just had a bad day. And if you ever dealt with any kind of addictive problems, this is, I, mean, I had a bad day. For a lot of years of my life, my bad days ended up with a trip to the ABC store. And, and I, drunk, I drank myself happy that night. Drank myself until I passed out, or whatever it was. But I was gratifying my flesh. I had a bad day, so I needed to gratify my emotions. So I go out and drink. Some people go out and do drugs. Some people do different things. Um, I'm a stress eater by nature. Amen. If I get stressed out, I want to eat and then I want to sleep. That's how my, that's how I react to stress. So the thing about it is, they're trying to under control the stress. So I can control the stress eating. 
but we have to be able to modify that. Inner strength under the direction of sound judgment. Sound judgment of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen. Leading us and guiding us into all truths. In Christ, we have the strength to control self. Or we have self-control. Amen. Whatever your struggle is, and I'm sure that every person in here has some kind of a struggle. That you want, to, you want, to, you want gratification. You want to satisfy a need in your life and it becomes excessive or obsessive and now we need to be able to control that or modify that. And in Christ, we can do that. Emphasis and self-control should be on growth. The battle for self-control is in our mind. Amen. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I can talk about eating. I, you know, I can be completely full. Had, had well plenty enough food didn't need anything to eat. But it's like I, I can get into that thing in my mind and start thinking about a snack or a food. Um, I used to get in trouble in here on Wednesday nights because I started talking about ice cream. And then people are like, don't you be talking about ice cream. So you, you can convince yourself, yeah, but you don't have to have ice cream. after. Just go to McDonald's. That's, that's, that's the answer. Just go to McDonald's and try to order a Sunday after church on Wednesday night because I guarantee you that ice cream machine is broken. So God, God has an answer for you there. But again, self-control begins in our minds. Our passions, thoughts, and desires must be on the subject of earnest prayer for God's grace to work in our, in our, in our lives or our wills. So we start thinking about problems we have. What's the first thing that we should do about problems that we have? Start praying about it. Turn it over to the Lord. Give it over to Him completely. Developing temperance. Learn to say no. Learn to set boundaries. Setting boundaries is, is a big thing. Um, if, if you're trying to quit smoking, just give me your cigarettes. Let me take them to my house. And then you just, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you got to have a cigarette, it means you got to come to my house, come to my door, get me out of bed and bring you your cigarette. That's a good boundary. Because I'm going to sit there, I'm going to come to the door and I'm going to open them up and I'm going to crush your cigarettes and because you woke me up for this, I'm going back to bed. Okay. Um, again, set boundaries. Um, if you have a drinking problem, don't, don't keep alcohol in your house. If you have an M&M &M problem, don't keep M&Ms in your house. Amen. If you're trying to quit smoking, don't buy cigarettes. Don't keep them in the house. Um, there's, there's just things for healthy boundaries. We have to have boundaries in our lives. Um, learn, and I love this, learn new habits to replace the old ones. There are healthy habits. There really are. Um, you know, when I first, back in May, when I first started my diet, I was still refusing to exercise. I was just like, I'm not exercising. I'm not getting on that Bowflex. I'm not doing it. And then it's like, after a little while, I decided, well, I'm going to start trying it. And it's, it's become a habit now. It's, it's a good habit. So it's like at least five, at least five days a week, I find myself exercising. And when, and then after exercise, I eat healthy food. These things, I'm not saying I'm perfect and eat healthy all the time. I, I know I don't. But it's like develop healthy habits. I started reading. I started reading a book a week or a book every 10 days or something like that. That's a new habit that I started. Trying to replace bad habits with good habits. And you start thinking, what are some habits that you, that you could create in your life? You know, a lot of stuff, just sensible things. But the Holy Spirit makes these things work out in our life. Um... You, you, know, you know when your food cravings are going to hit. Start putting something else in place there at that time. Uh, talk to people, you know, about who are trying to quit smoking. I hear, I've always heard the same thing. But that first cup of coffee in the morning, well, quit drinking coffee first thing in the morning. Do something else. Do something else. Back in the day when we had horses, we had something we used to help people with with smoking. The horses used to get mane hair stuck in the fence. And we'd take those hairs, those main hairs, and we'd fold them in half, and we'd put them down inside of somebody's cigarette and not let them know it. And then they lit that cigarette, and that horse hair started burning when they smoked it. It, it, helped, it helped a whole lot. But, yeah, I mean, it's like I talked to somebody one time, and this, this was just the Holy Spirit one day. Somebody, I, they, I said, get, go get you a big bag of Lifesavers. Well, I've been chewing gum and ain't working. I said, I didn't say chew gum. I said, go get you a big bag of Lifesavers. And they went and got a big bag of Lifesavers that day. And they said, three days later, I don't even want a cigarette anymore. Well, did that work for you? 
And that was just like I said, the Holy Spirit was with me of that day. And they told me, go get you a big bag of lifesavers. And it was, I still remember, they said, well, I've been chewing gum, but it don't work. Well, go get some lifesavers. I didn't say, you know, this ain't chew gum. You know, find something. You know, a lot of us, the habit. You know, if that's your habit. Um, when I quit, you know, when I got saved and God took alcohol from me, there was still a bit of a habit sometime when I came home from work to open the refrigerator. Because I did that every day for many, many years. I came home and I opened the refrigerator and I grabbed a beer as soon as I got home. So the, the drinking had stopped, but some of the habit was still there. I had to introduce new habits into my life. Amen. So that was the extent of the fruit of the Spirit. But your study notes are a great tool in there. I suggest you take your study notes. Go read all those scriptures and go with that. Keep that handy. If there are certain areas of this that we've talked about that you see are weak areas of your life, pray. Ask God to point out some things. But read those scriptures. The, the answer truly is in God's Word. And it's not hard to understand. It's actually pretty simple when you just read it with an open mind and an open spirit. And pray before you read and ask God. Say, God, I'm struggling with I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. Can you help me with this? And let him lead his word. Amen. Amen. Final thoughts or comments? Questions? Like I said, this is all on YouTube. This last section will be on YouTube. Again, Chip, thank you so much for helping us out uh, throughout the course of this. Um, keeping this um, every week posted on there. So it's going to be set up as a playlist for some teaching materials. Um, refer it to friends. All the notes that we've been using re recently are, there's a link to the notes on the YouTube videos where you can have the notes to go along with this also. And it's there for people to use. So feel free to share it with somebody. Well, if everybody's good, we'll get out of here. I'm done before 8 o'clock. Hallelujah. So we can close up. Y'all can still go grab you a cup of coffee for the road if you need it. Amen. But let's close up in prayer. And I'm going to call on somebody to close us up in prayer tonight. Um, Melissa, would you close us up in prayer tonight, please? Father God, we thank, thank you for you. the time that you brought us together to learn about the gifts of your spirit, about fruit of the Spirit. We open ourselves up. We ask that you continue to pour into us. I ask that you be with everybody as they go home tonight and bring us all back safely to worship you on Sunday. In the name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.